It had been a rainy March morning when Jay Hodge had boarded the train bound for the West. He'd lived his entire life in the sleepy West Ohio village of his birth, only for all peace to be sundered a few short weeks ago. The family farm was beset one blood-black night in February. His parents were slaughtered by a brigand, or perhaps several. Jay hadn't been there. He and a farmhand, Kyle Ritten, had been in town on an errand and shacked up at the local inn. The carnage had been found the morning after. A seemingly random and senseless act had taken his family from him. News carried that similar senseless killings had been carried out, and a trail of corpses headed west in a perfectly straight line. Jay had tracked the stories best he could, and they were headed towards the Erie Valley and the gold rush town of cessation therein. So Jay sold the farm, and with Kyle in tow, they headed westward for vengeance. Albert Minter, or Old Al, as he preferred to go by, washed away a layer of sediment from his pan. The old eyes looking for that yellow glint, that sparkle of wealth. Sure enough, there it was, and in abundance. Never before had the old prospector seen such a sight. Oh, how the Erie River was bountiful in gold. His time in California and the Black Hills hadn't shown much luster before. This valley was practically made of gold. It was as if El Dorado itself sat beneath the earth of these mountains. He was going to be a very, very wealthy man before long. Yet something ate at him, like it was too good to be true. Yet the luster was stronger in the old man's bones, so he persisted and quenched that feeling of dread. Samuel Lovett pulled the trigger in a flash and a boom and a waft of acrid smoke the bank teller's head exploded. The forty-five slug making carnage of the skull's inner contents, a Rorschach pattern of blood and brain matter made a mockery of the posy wallpaper that adorned the bank. An unnecessary act. However, the gunfire outside had startled him, and in a panic, he had murdered the banker. It wasn't the first time he had murdered. Certainly would not be the last. Skeeter began to shout, a call to retreat. Samuel took one last look at the dead man and then headed out the back door in a mad dash. Gus Farnham looked back at the wagon train. Fifty wagons in a slow crawl southwestward from Laramie. They were headed for cessation. His eyes rested upon the colorful stagecoach of the Mortems. An aged couple who said they had a theater built in the gold town. They were said to be older than Crisis. Gus believed that. Never before had he laid eyes upon such an elderly-looking man and woman, and yet the pair got along fine without complaint. Their son sat at the reins, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed freight train of a man who looked like some Greek demigod or perhaps a Nordic raider of old. A tall, Silent man, eyes like ice, one of many adopted children in the Mortem's ranks. Gus looked away from the lad and back to the trail. The peaks of the Perdition Mountains not far away. There beyond lay the Erie River Valley, and cessation of which Gus held the title of mayor. Buzzard stood at the center of the Valley of the Dead. There he had found them, seven men, white men once, their corpses now skeletons bleached and sandblasted in the unforgiving heat of that lethal expanse of desert. Not a creature had touched them. These thieving would-be pioneers who had died justly, they had dared to roam where no one could tread without permission. 
These dead men were just bones in their clothes. The tools of their industrial culture lay in their hands, untarnished. It was as if these seven men had died and simply been stripped of flesh by the sands themselves. Buzzard knew better. Forces in the Valley of the Dead had prepared these men to serve Buzzard's means. They were to be a tool, sent east, to punish another grave trespass by the white man upon sacred ground. F.D. Calloway glanced at his cards. Two pair aces with a king kicker. He looked at the pot. Fourteen dollars in Arizona silver. Bisbee markings. Save the two dollars of his own. Which was stamped with tombstone marks. Yet here he sat in Globe, another silver town in this particular territory of Arizona. He tossed in another six dollars in silver to raise. Of the seven men at the table, all folded save one other. Across from F.D. sat Yemet Thompson, another notorious Arizona gambler. Yemet scratched his handlebar mustache and then called. The two showed their hands. Yemet had two pair queens with a jack kicker. F.D. had won and knocked Yemet out of the game. The two stared at each other for a long moment. Yemet reached into his coat and F.D. flicked his wrists as Yemet pulled a cut-down old ball and cap navy from his coat. F.D. let fly with his two pearl-handled nickel derringers. The two 41 caliber bullets tore into Yemet's center mass, punched through his heart, and ended him instantly. The old navy with its sawed-off barrel clattered to the floor and fired, sending a stray round into the street where the 38 caliber ball embedded itself into a hitching post. F.D. stood collected his winnings, and stepped out into the street. He reloaded his two derringers, then mounted his horse. With a click of his tongue and a nudge of his heels, he directed the horse northbound out of the town, headed to better prospects in cessation. He could not remember his name. It did not matter. The only thing that mattered was the clarion call that echoed in his head. A force beyond description pulled him westwards, so he marched, day and night, as the crow flew. The voice called, and he would answer. All obstacles were of no consequence. He saw mountains, a valley, a river, and gold in his head. This was not acceptable. He had to get there before it was too late. What exactly would go wrong, he did not know, he did not care. All he knew was he must get there, and soon. They had to be stopped. Jay Hodge and Kyle Ritten got off the train in the small old town of Puertas. The closest stop any train came to the Perdition Mountains at the mouth of the Erie River Valley. From that old, dusty Spanish mission town, it would be a few hours ride by stagecoach to cessation. Jay and Kyle packed into a green stage with the golden lettering of Old Hotel Line painted on the side. The other stagecoach circuit was painted red, with the colorful signage Abuelo in Run adorning it. The Abuelo stage had cost an additional five cents over the Old Hotel's coach, so the Old Hotel was selected out of budget concerns more than anything. Jay and Kyle didn't speak much. They'd been on a train for several days together. Neither one had been much for conversation since the murders. They weren't here for gold, but to avenge the fallen and stop a mass murderer. A most heartfelt thank you to my patrons and subscribers. I wouldn't be able to do this without y'all. Be sure to like, subscribe, comment down below. I have a Patreon. It's in the description of the video. You can also find my Twitter and my Discord server there if you would like to join the community and help this channel grow. I hope you enjoyed this story, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks again, everyone.